Søren Kierkegaard, Various Readings Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7 Søren Kierkegaard By David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota Editor A. M. Sturdivant February 1920 Chapters 9 and 10 Pages 36 through 41 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Moment Chapter 9 From September 1851 to December 1854, there was a pause in the steady stream of publications flowing from Kierkegaard's pen ever since the year 1843. His reflection had not become sterile, but its energy was consumed in self-preparation for a new role, one more decisive than any he had yet played, as the journals of the period bear witness. He was engaged in probing the distance between modern life and the ideals which it professes, and particularly his reflection seized upon the difference between the life of Christendom and the Christianity of the New Testament. As always, his thought was impassioned, pregnant with indignation and scorn. Financial worries, which had assailed him for some time, helped to mature his personality, and there are indications that Kierkegaard began during this period a course of self-discipline by means of ascetic exercises to replace the somewhat luxurious life he had permitted himself earlier to lead. Then, in the year 1854, came an opportunity which, in view of his previous publications, appealed to him as a challenge that must be squarely met. In the fall of 1853, Bishop Minster died. He had been a pulpiteer of great ability, and as bishop he had ruled the church with a strong and conservative hand. Kierkegaard maintained close personal relations with him. Minster had been his father's pastor. He admired his ability and had frequently defended him against attacks which he deemed unjustified. But he had not hesitated to let him know where and how far he differed from him. A few weeks after Minster's death, Professor Martinson, parenthesis, whose Christian dogmatics had so wide a vogue in theological circles at one time, in parenthesis, preached a memorial sermon in which the late bishop was eulogized as, quote, one more link in the holy chain of witnesses for the truth, stretching all the way from the days of the apostles to our own times, end quote. This idealization of Bishop Minster seemed to Kierkegaard an impudent falsification of the Christian ideal, symptomatic of that demoralization to which Christendom as a whole was subject. He wrote at once a brief but emphatic protest. Professor Martinson was a candidate for the vacant bishopric, and hence Kierkegaard postponed publication until the appointment was announced so as to avoid entanglement with political cross-currents and other irrelevant considerations. Martinson received the appointment, and in December 1854, the article was published in the columns of a daily newspaper in Copenhagen. It places in question the truth of the assertion that Bishop Minster was a witness for the truth, maintaining that both as regards the content of his preaching in the form of his personal life, Bishop Minster fell far short of the Christian ideal of a witness. It accuses Professor Martinson of plain Christianity, just as children play at being soldiers. This decisive attack upon the ideal legitimization of the established order created a sensation and naturally awakened a storm of protest. Kierkegaard was accused of attacking the memory of the dead and of violating the sanctity of the grave, of a lack of earnestness of purpose, of an overweening personal pride, of being insane, 
and of whatever else the wounded feelings of his antagonists could invent. But Kierkegaard brushed objections and objectors aside, keeping straight to his main theme, and maintaining it with increasing intensity. For four months, publishing altogether a score of articles at irregular intervals, Kierkegaard kept up the agitation in the columns of Federlandet, Fatherland, it quickly became clear that here was no attack upon the reputation of Bishop Minster, as that phrase would be ordinarily understood, but that Denmark was confronted with a most searching critique of the whole established order which Bishop Minster represented. Quote, if Bishop Minster is a witness for the truth, then every clergyman in the country, as even the blindest can see, is also a witness for the truth. What we call being a clergyman, priest, or bishop is a means of livelihood, just like every other in the community, and a means of livelihood carried on, if you please, within a community where all call themselves Christians, where there is therefore not the slightest danger connected with the preaching of the Christian doctrine, but where, on the contrary, this situation in life must be regarded as one of the most respected and attractive. Now I ask, is there the slightest resemblance between these clergymen, priests, bishops, and what Christ calls his witnesses? Or is it not ridiculous to call such clergymen, priests, bishops, quote, witnesses, end quote, in the sense of the New Testament, as ridiculous as to call field maneuvers in the time of peace, war, but Bishop Martinson persists in calling them witnesses, witnesses for the truth. If the clergy understood their own interests in the matter, they would without delay petition the bishop to give up his terminology, which puts the whole profession, to say the least, in a ridiculous light. For I know several most respectable and able, very able clergymen, but I venture to say that in the whole kingdom there is not one who, when viewed in the light of a witness for the truth, does not present a comic figure. End quote. With rapid strides and bold strokes, Kierkegaard advanced to the position that the notion of a Christian people or nation is an illusion, that a Christianity with official sanction and authority is directly contrary to the teaching of Christ that Protestantism in general is a silly, dishonest perversion of Christianity, and that New Testament Christianity is so completely non-existent in modern states that it is nonsense even to talk of a reformation, there being nothing to reform. In two separately published leaflets, the situation was intensified, almost to the breaking point. Quote, Wherever you are, my friend, and whatever your life may be, by refusing any longer to take part, parenthesis, if you have hitherto done so, end parenthesis, in the public worship as it is now conducted, with the pretense of being the New Testament Christianity, you will have one less crime, and a heavy one, upon your conscience, for you will no longer take part in making a mockery of God. End quote. And shortly after this pronouncement, he sharply called the attention of the public to the fact that the clergy were bound by oath to the New Testament, and then went on to apply the words of Christ in Matthew 23, verses 29 through 33, and Luke 11, 47 and 48, without reservation to an official Christianity of every description, and particularly to that of the Danish church. The last week in May, Kierkegaard began the publication of a pamphlet called The Moment, in which altogether nine numbers appeared up to the end of September. A tenth number was made ready for publication, but its appearance was delayed by Kierkegaard's last illness, so that it came to be published posthumously. In these stirring pamphlets, the agitation is carried on to its last consequences and the measure of the distance between the Christian ideal and the actual life of the Christian world is taken with a certainty and an accuracy that leaves no illusion unexposed. He was a great agitator, says Brandes, 
His soul was full to the brim with a living indignation, and he had the language completely in his power. By his religious writings, he had trained himself to speak the plain man's tongue, and his quiver was full of the sharpest arrows of wit. He was just the man to carry on an agitation of which the 19th century will scarcely see the equal. He united the personal weight of a La Salle to the eloquence of an O'Connell and the biting scorn of a Dean Swift. It is impossible to describe his procedure. One must see how he chisels his scorn into linguistic form and hammers the word until it shapes itself into the greatest possible, the bloodiest injury without for a moment ceasing to be the vehicle of an idea. End quote. His purpose was ideal. He had no finite end in view, no proposal of a changed organization, no displacement of authorities, no derogation of persons, nothing but a clarification of consciousness in the direction of greater honesty and sincerity. For those who wondered what his motive might be, he replied, Quote, I want honesty. I do not represent Christian severity as over against Christian mildness by no means. I represent neither severity nor mildness. I stand for human honesty. And if the human race or my contemporaries wish honestly, sincerely, frankly, openly to rebel against Christianity and to say to God, quote, we cannot and will not subject ourselves to this power, end quote. Well and good, providing this be done openly, frankly, and sincerely. Then, however strange it may seem to me to say this, I am with them, for I want honesty, end quote. In October 1855, he fell in a faint on the street and was taken to a hospital. In the notes of the young intern who kept an account of the case, there are incorporated certain expressions to which Kierkegaard gave utterance. The following is from the first day's journal. Quote, he considers his disease mortal. His death is necessary to the cause. He has used all his spiritual and intellectual powers to further the cause for which alone he has lived, and which he considers himself especially called and fitted to serve whence the great intellectual powers with which he has been endowed in connection with so frail a body. If he were to live, he would have to continue his religious agitation, but people would soon tire of it. If he dies, on the other hand, the strength of his cause will be maintained, and as he thinks, it's victory. End quote. On the 11th of November, he died, 42 years and six months old. It appeals as a fitting poetic symbolism that the patrimony, which had made his untiring literary labors possible, should have been found just exhausted at the time of his death. Chapter 10 It would be interesting to speculate upon the reputation that Kierkegaard might have attained and the extent of the influence he might have exerted if he had written in one of the major European languages instead of in the tongue of one of the smallest countries in the world. An idealism more powerful and more consistent than that of either Emerson or Carlyle, a democratic individualism as thoroughgoing as the aristocratic individualism of Nietzsche, and presented with an equally passionate intensity, an ethical voluntarism clothed in a literary form as persuasive as that of Schopenhauer's philosophy, and a species of pragmatism more carefully and thoroughly worked out than that of either James or Bergson. These qualities must have attracted worldwide attention, and yet he himself believed that the limitations under which he was compelled to labor and the consequent lack of any effective opposition from the outside was a necessary factor in the peculiar development of his personality, and one demanded by his peculiar task. Had he written in English or in German, there would have naturally been enough significant opposition to have consumed a great part of his energy in external polemic. 
As it was, the outward opposition was negligible. He was compelled to set his own standard and to be his own critic. His reflection was thus turned inward in a greater measure than would otherwise have been possible. This he regarded as essential for the kind of literature it was his mission to produce. This literature will always remain, in one sense, a luxury. It does not have the kind of one-sidedness which would adapt it for the foundation of a school or the promotion of a movement. Nevertheless, it is bound to have an enduring significance, for it, quote, delineates the essential thought determinations of life and of individual existence in a manner more dialectically precise and more emotionally primitive than anything comparable to be found in any modern literature. David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota. End of article. Scandinavian Studies and Notes, Volume 6, Number 7. Søren Kierkegaard, by David F. Swenson, University of Minnesota. Editor A. M. Sturdivant, February 1920. Pages 1 through 41.